good morning and welcome again to Abundant Life Church. We are um, welcoming Brother Ryan back this morning to share a message. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I I received all of it, all of it, and uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I might need another battery here. Yeah, I'm, I I need uh, a couple of new batteries. This this is showing that it's it's dead. I need some power. Uh, yes, double A's. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> If not, I'm going to have to stay right here and not move. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Let's see. Yes. We are good. All right. Guys, test one, two. Okay. Oh, man. Oh, so you know? All right. I've got green. Oh. Uh, now we're good. Test, check. Check, check. You're good. It's going to happen. There we go. There we go. More gooder, more better. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> uh, yeah, thank you so much for that. I, I, I truly value <clears throat> the, uh, the prayers, the encouragement, the declarations. So grateful uh, for those. And so we're going to just jump right into some stuff. Uh, I, I just got in <clears throat> pretty late last night from D.C. Uh, I was... Um, doing some ministry up there, <clears throat> and um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I, well, maybe I do do stay here, I've got to stay here, all right, it's all right, we'll make it work, we're gonna, we're gonna do this, all right, so, so yeah, I uh, was in D.C. for a few days, got in pretty late last night, uh, we were ministering to some business people, so we did, we did one one day of like covert ministry, right, where they don't really know who we are. And then we did one night of just like total prophetic, like we prophesied over everybody and ministered to everybody and, and, and all of that good stuff and, and just shared on, uh, on some things that, you know, we were feeling. And so got, got delayed in Chicago and uh, got in super late. Yesterday was my younger brother's birthday, and so went to my dad's, ate some tortilla soup, went home, and crashed out. And so <laughs> it was a full day of travel, and so I'm so glad to be here with you all today. And uh, it's an honor. It really is an honor. I, I, I'm always asking the Lord, you know, Lord, what, what can I deposit? What can I share? And I want to go to Luke 4.18. Luke 4.18, because uh, one of the things the Lord <clears throat> uh, last year... So I, I often ask the Lord, right around October through the end of the year, I'll begin to ask the Lord, is there something... Was it me? <laughs> Maybe so. Okay. All right. Check one, two. Ooh, a little bit of feedback, but definitely have some sound there. All right, we just want to make sure everybody's awake. And uh, so hopefully that was a quick, quick shot of adrenaline. And uh, <laughs> all right, appreciate all the technical masterminds back there fixing everything, getting it all going. That is definitely a high stress uh, job sometimes. So, ooh, and I get to walk around, and I get to 
All right, we are mobile. So, um, <clears throat> so I'll begin to ask the Lord towards the latter part of the year, like, Lord, is there something you're wanting to highlight for the upcoming year? And when I, when I began to ask the Lord uh, late 2022, it was October 2022, uh, for some things that he was wanting to, to you know, shine some light on or highlight to me for 2023, one of them was that we were going to see uh, a, a renewed emphasis on deliverance, but we would need to... We would need to reframe deliverance through a kingdom model. In other words, a lot of the old school deliverance, like I grew up in a lot of the old school deliverance, uh, which really, you know, without, without thinking about it or without saying it, I would say a lot of our model of deliverance, um, as, as I was growing up in the church, we still had kind of like what I would say a big devil, little God perspective. And so, you know, whenever it came to somebody who needed some type of deliverance, some type of, of freedom, um, it was, it was kind of like this. It was like, well, you need to, you know, come to us. We're going to pray for you. We're going to get this thing out of your life. And, and there were a lot of, there were a lot of really bad models that we used. For one, here's what I've come to realize about deliverance. We don't have a powerful devil. We have powerful people who have powerful agreements. This is what I'm saying. It's not, it's not that we have a powerful devil. It's that you're powerful and your agreement with lies, our agreement with lies is what's powerful. And that's what the Lord began to teach me years ago as he began to redefine intercession. He began to redefine spiritual warfare and then over this past year, like deliverance was kind of next on the scene for me, where God began to redefine deliverance for me through a kingdom context. And so again, you know, and, and, and it's sad too, because uh, so many people have, uh, you, you, know, you realize, uh, man, I was, I was looking up these statistics. <clears throat> uh, I don't know if I have them on me right now, but over the last oh, year or several years, actually, the, the top three most viewed movies and TV shows on, on uh, streaming videos were all horror and supernatural, like a negative supernatural, which tells you what? That there is an infatuation or there is a curiosity, there is a hunger for those types of things. But see, the thing is this, if the church is not bringing the truth of the unseen realm, and the truth of the victory of Jesus over the demonic, then, then Hollywood and, and society will begin to paint a picture of how powerful darkness is. It's not a powerful system of darkness. It, it, it's, it's Jesus has truly disarmed, stripped of authority, principalities and powers. So think about this. Like in Genesis, the picture you have in the book of Genesis is God gave dominion, authority over everything to who? To humanity, right? Adam and Eve. To humanity. Those with the... He, he puts His image, right? He's in His likeness, in His image, and then He says, now, be fruitful, multiply, and, and uh, subdue, which is authority, and have dominion. So when the serpent comes, when the enemy comes in, how much authority and dominion did the enemy have? No. Zero. Zero, right? So what was the mode of operation? What was the, 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 the strategy of the enemy in Genesis? The one with no authority goes to the ones who have authority in order to get their agreement because their agreement... See, here's the thing. When I believe a lie, I empower the liar. The enemy doesn't have any dominion of his own or any authority of his own. He's borrowing ours. He's, he's looking for agreement. And when he finds that agreement, and I begin to speak the things... Right? I begin to speak how, you know, whether it's something against my own life, against my... Nobody's home. Uh, against, against, 
my family against, you know, I mean, it's like there are, I, I, who was this? There was a, a comedian who was saying, um, I can't remember his name. He said, my, my dad never blessed me. How did he say it? He said, my dad never blessed me. He always cursed me, oh. right? Like, you, you'll, you'll never this or whatever. <clears throat> and he says, and then I met somebody who always cussed at me, but he blessed me. <laughs> it was like, you know, he, he says he, he, he had just like, you know, really foul language. He says, but in the midst of all of that, in the midst of, of, of him always, you know, using this kind of language, he always blessed me, though. He said, man, you know what? You're going to go far. And there was probably a bunch of obscenity, obscene words in that one sentence there. But he would tell him, you're going to make it. You're going to, you're going to get to where you, want to, where you see yourself or whatever. And, and it's like there's a lot of people that they, they never had blessings growing up, right? And so they don't know what it is to be blessed, and they don't know what it is to bless themselves. You know, I love the prophetic, but let me tell you where the prophetic starts. It starts with you prophesying to yourself. Right? Look in the mirror and prophesy to yourself. <laughs> See yourself the way God sees you. And speak about yourself the way God speaks about you. Amen? Amen. And so, so when, when I asked the Lord about deliverance, or, or I asked the Lord about 2023, He said there would be a renewed emphasis on deliverance, but it would need to be redefined through the kingdom. So again, my old models of deliverance, the way we used to do it back in the day, it was this powerless person coming to us who had authority, and they were, they were you know, uh, afflicted by some powerful demon. And, and I don't know, you know, we, we, we just, we had all these different ideas, not realizing, and this is what the Lord began to teach me several years ago. <clears throat> he said, Ryan, spiritual warfare is not a battle against powerful demons, he said, it is, it is all about truth and lies, right? He says, it's a battle of agreement, and the weapons are truth and lies. Amen. And so, you know, we heard for so many years about strongholds always in the negative, the stronghold of the enemy, right? Stronghold of lie. But you know, the word stronghold simply means a fortified place. It's not necessarily negative. Or, it, it can be whatever you want it to be. See, how many know David said, that he, that the Lord was his stronghold. The Lord was his strong tower. See, we focused so much on the strongholds of lies, we never built in people the strongholds of truth. If you can build truth in people, their agreement automatically shifts from the lies and dispowers the, the enemy in their life, disempowers. Does that make sense? So we were fighting so much, fighting darkness, fighting the enemy, and I was like, wait, I'll give you an example of this. I'll give you an example. Because we used to like, you know, people, especially people that were, uh, that were demonized, like, I mean, we were rolling on the floor, we're throwing Bibles on them, we're throwing oil on them, we're, you know, <clears throat> we're, we're doing we're the human resource department of the kingdom, what's your name, how long you've been in there, who else is in there with you, and I mean, we did the whole, the whole nine yards. This is what we, this is all we knew, yeah. right? <laughs> and, and, it was, and it was all about you know, what's your name? And, and, we're, and we're trying and we're battling and we're... And then the Lord began to, to shift all this. And, and when he began to talk to me about, he says, Ryan, uh, he says, you can, you can battle darkness all day or you can turn the light on. I said, that sounds way easier. <laughs> In other words, you can try to to battle every single lie, or you can bring in truth that makes people free. Amen. Now, it's okay to expose the lie, right? It's okay to, to discern the lie, but, but the real thing, the real, the real winner here is bringing truth Amen. and replacing the stronghold of the enemy with the stronghold of God, Amen. right? I love, I love the, the prophet Jeremiah, the commission that God gave to him in, in, in Jeremiah, he says, I'm sending you to uproot and plant, to tear down and to build up. And so for a lot of our, our models, it was all about uproot and tear down. But man, we really needed to work on 
how to plant something in the place of the lie. It wasn't enough just to say, yeah, this is the lie. Yeah, you've got addiction or, oh, it was this and that. And we uproot that. We had to put something in its place. So I'll give you an example of this, of, of what... Uh, when, I was leading a, when I was leading a church here in San Antonio, we, we, my wife and I, we pastored a, a church that we started out of our living room and led that for about 11 years. And, um, and I remember this is during the time that the Lord was just redefining so much for me. And I was getting these downloads from the Lord, and he was retraining me, redefining the whole warfare thing. So one of the, one of the young uh, men in our youth group, uh, I remember him telling me one time, he's like, you know, Ryan, sometimes uh, my mom starts talking and it's like, it's not really her. And her voice changes, her face changes, you know, all these different things and blah, 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 and whatever. And, and so one time his mom came to pick him up and, uh, from, uh, from one of the services and he runs inside and he says, uh, and he would say all the stuff that she would tell the kids, you know, it was really, really dark things and so she uh he, he runs inside and he says ryan he goes my mom's here but it's not her i said okay so so i walk outside she's sitting in the driver's seat she's got a, a a van her window's down he runs and sits in the passenger seat and and as i'm walking up to the to her vehicle i hear her getting mad at him saying why did you say anything why did you call him and so i walk up to the to the van and uh and i said is I said, everything okay? And she looks at me real fast and, and just with, you know, ugly voice and whatever. She's like, what do you think? And I said, I think you're going to have to go because I knew what I was talking to. I said, I think you're going to have to go. And it says, I'm not going anywhere and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and all these, you know, all these things, all these threats or whatever that, uh, that it, it was saying. And uh, I said, that's not going to happen. I said, that, none of that's going to happen. And then it, you know, tried to impress me with, I'm, gave me its name, and, and I never even asked for it. Um, gave me its name and whatever, and, 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 uh, and said that it was the son of so-and-so, and, and I don't even remember all the names to it. And I, and, and I, and I just said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm Ryan, the son of God. And it got super angry. It's like, no, you're not. I said, I said, look, I'm done talking to you. And this was maybe like a 45-second conversation here, 30 seconds. And I, I said, I'm done talking to you. Uh, I want to talk to her. And so she comes to, and she's like, like, you know, what's going on? And, and Holy Spirit discernment just kicks in. And, uh, and I just start telling her, I said, I said are, you, are you just tired of being tormented? And she just starts crying. She's like, yes, I'm so tired. I'm so tired of it. And I said, you want to just forgive them for what they did? And she goes, yes, yes, I do, I do. And, uh, and, and I said, just let's just pray. And she says, okay. And I said, I want you just to say, um, Lord Jesus. And she says, Lord Jesus. Je and she couldn't say Jesus. And I said, no, no, no. I said, we're not going to play that game. You have no authority over her will. You have no authority over her will. You must allow her to speak what she wants to speak. So she says, Lord Jesus. And I said, and just say, I forgive. And she says, uh, I, you know, and she couldn't get it. I said, no, no, I already warned you. We are not playing that game. You have no... See, I wasn't trying to deal with the spirit. I was dealing with the powerful one, her. The spirit wasn't the powerful one. She was the powerful one. She just didn't know it. So, I, so when she said, I forgive, immediately she just goes, and she was freed. Not even two minutes. <laughs> I mean, less than two minutes, and she's free... Why? We, we could have said old school, right? Come on inside, bust out the oil, and, the, and you know, we're going we're gonna to go to work. We're the powerful ones. We're going to get you free. No, no, no. She was the powerful one. She just didn't know it. And so when, she, when her agreement shifted, that thing no longer had any room to operate in her life. Are you with me? And so, so deliverance is not about we, the powerful people, trying to deal with a super powerful spirit. No, no. It's us reminding people of how powerful God has made them. Because if not, even if they get free, 
they will remain a victim to always having to come to us rather than understanding their identity and their authority in the kingdom of God. Amen? So, so this is what the Lord began to talk to me about for 2023, about deliverance. And, and it was like, well, man, well, we need to see this being redefined uh, in the body of Christ. And, and that it's, it's not, you know, we, we've got to shift our, listen, whenever we think of deliverance, the first things that come to mind are demons, generational curses, soul ties, demonic strongholds, the devil having legal authority in your life, um, you know, opening the door to the devil in your life, demonology, like all of these things are the things, it's interesting, right? October seems to be the month where all this kind of stuff really you know, I wasn't planning this at all. I wasn't even going to talk about all of these things here. I was just going to get into 418, Luke 418. Because <clears throat> one of the things the Lord said to me for 2023, he talked to me about deliverance. And then he began to talk to me about uh, the number 418, how 418 would be very significant for this month. And there's a few passages, and one of them is Luke 418, which we, we probably are going to try to get into today. Um, <clears throat> but... But the thing is this, is that whenever we think of deliverance, those are typically the first things that come to mind for most people. And, and I want us to shift that because when, when we think of deliverance, I want us to think of the victory of Jesus. Hallelujah. I want us to think of not a powerful enemy, but a powerful savior, a powerful deliverer. Amen. And so some people will say, well, but, but there's... Um, some people will even challenge, you know, deliverance uh, as, a, as a ministry. I was like, well, you know, I've had people say, well, you know, the word deliverance is not in the Bible, like the way we, we use it. And I said, well, but um, setting captives free is, yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's pretty clear in the Bible. And so, so we, we, we know that it is, that liberation comes from truth, right? Uh, liberation comes from truth. And the problem is that we've made deliverance more about the enemy than we have about what Jesus has accomplished. So I believe we need to get, we need to be equipped um, <clears throat> for people to experience freedom. Man, listen, the, the, the cross and the resurrection, the work of Jesus was not only about forgiveness of sins. We can thank Jesus for that all our life, right? Yeah. But it's not, that's like one layer of the multitudes of layers because it's also about freedom. It's also about empowering. It is empowering you to where you are not a victim. I'm concerned that in society over the last several years, we have celebrated victims. Victims don't need to be celebrated. Victims need to be empowered, and then we celebrate their overcoming. Because if you, if you celebrate a victim, they'll stay in that. You empower people who have been victims of something. You empower them with truth, and then you celebrate their overcoming. You celebrate their victory. Amen? <clears throat> so, so I... Uh, okay, let me get into Luke 14, or we're... We're going to stay here all day. <laughs> all right, Luke 4.18. Um, <clears throat> now, notice this, Luke 4.18. I, 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 love, I love this passage here, very familiar passage. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to... Now, notice, notice there's, there's um, I wouldn't say five, I believe there's five different, I don't want to say categories, but five different dimensions that Jesus mentions here. He says, um, let me read the verse. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the reco and the recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Five different dimensions that the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jesus and anointed Jesus for. Five different dimensions. The first, preach, preach to the poor. Two, heal the brokenhearted. Three, proclaim to the captive. Four, recovery of sight to the blind. And five, set at liberty those who are oppressed. I may only get to the first one today. If we're lucky, maybe number two, uh, the second one. But, but there's five different scenarios that 
freedom needs to come to people in these five different areas. And, and it's interesting to me, five different types of, uh, how, do, how do I say this? Five different types of conditions each of those five conditions has a different solution. Do you notice that? He could have just said, um, <clears throat> preach to the poor, the brokenhearted, the captive, the blind, and the oppressed. He could have just said, I'm, I'm here to preach to all five. No, but there is something specific to each condition. Right? <clears throat> and so the first one here, uh, bring good news Right? Preach the gospel. How many know the word gospel means good news, right? Man, I've, I've been saying for over a decade, if you don't have any good news, don't say anything. <laughs> All right? It ain't the gospel. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so gospel. So, so the poor. Now, we, a lot of times we'll think of this just as a um, physical condition, a monetary, right? A money condition, right? To the poor, right? If you make under a certain amount, Jesus came to preach good news to you. How many know that's not what this is about? This is not about poor in the sense of your finances. Um, <clears throat> that could apply. But the word poor here literally is the word beggar. Uh, someone who was destitute. Now, <clears throat> think. Now we got to get out of 21st century American mindset for a second. Let's go back to 1st century Jewish thinking and culture. Somebody who was, no, let me say, let me start this way. <clears throat> in the Jewish culture, there is a high value for inheritance. And there is a high value for your generations taking upon themselves your business and, and leaving a legacy, right? I mean, you, you, and they were getting this all the way back from, from Proverbs, right? A good man leaves an inheritance to who? His children's children, right? <clears throat> so, which is three generations. And so, so that Hebrew mindset has such a high value for inheritance, for passing on legacy, passing on skills, trades. Uh, Jesus taking on the trade of, of Joseph, right? Carpenter. Uh, and so, so that was really huge. So if in that time period you were destitute, poor, beggar, <clears throat> well, something happened. Something happened. You, you were either orphaned. Um, it was <clears throat> either you were orphaned or you were separated from your inheritance. So the, the person who was poor at that time, nine times out of ten, this is what happened. Okay? There, it, was, it was an orphan situation or it was somehow they were separated from their inheritance. Okay? The point of it is that they were in a helpless state and they could not change their condition. They could not change their, their circumstances, okay? They could do nothing to improve their life. Now, to the religious mindset, okay, to the religious, and I'm talking negative religion, all right, like the religious groups, like the Pharisees, right? Those religious groups that were so critical and judgmental. Um, <clears throat> to the religious mindset, someone who was poor was worthless. They, they would be considered the dogs of society, right? Because if you're in that condition, then obviously God's cursed you. That would be their mindset. Same thing with somebody, for example, who had leprosy, Right? When somebody had leprosy, remember leprosy was a, a skin-eating disease. Uh, it was symbolic of sin many times in Scripture. And, and so <clears throat> uh, when, when there was somebody who had leprosy, the religious community believed they were cursed by God. If you were born blind, they believed you were cursed by God. Okay? Okay. In fact, you remember the blind man that Jesus healed with spit? You remember that? Do you know that when someone was uh, born blind, in fact, remember the question, Lord, is it his sin or his parents' sin that caused him to be born blind? You remember that? Because that was the extreme religious mentality. So they were like, God's cursed you. And 
you may, this, this, I know this might be kind of gross, but in those days, to spit on someone was to reaffirm the curse of God on their life. Do you know that somebody who was born blind like that or somebody who was in leprosy, um, very often they would be spit upon. Imagine this person who's blind. They, they're already having all of the challenges of blindness and the poverty that comes with blindness. And then to have somebody religious walk by you and spit on you as a reassuring sign you're cursed by God. <clears throat> Not only was he broken physically, but he's broken emotionally, broken spiritually. Because in his mind, I'm cursed. I'm cursed by God. God is far from me. And isn't it interesting that when Jesus heals that blind man, of all the ways that he could have healed him, he uses spit. The very thing that was supposed to be a sign of the curse of God becomes the healing of God. Because he wasn't only healing him physically, he was healing him emotionally and spiritually. Because the spit that came from the very Son of God was a sign the Father loves you. The Father is for you. And he heals that blindness because it wasn't about sin. And God definitely did not curse him. The Father was not cursing that man. That was the religious assumptions. And so Jesus comes in. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? So here's what the Father thinks about you. And he uses spit to heal that man. <clears throat> Whenever the Lord is doing miracles in Scripture, I, I want to encourage you, search out not just the miracle, but what's the message behind it? There's a message behind it, right? Whether it's touching the leper or using spit on the blind man. Anyway, okay, so I, um, I got off topic there, but I felt like that was important. <clears throat> um, because it was, it was part of the religious mindset that was misinterpreting God to people or misrepresenting God to people. So when you were poor, regardless of the reason, again, how many you know that blind man was definitely poor, right? But this was a beggar mentality. And so more than it being a financial thing, it was more about inheritance. It was about family. There was no family. There was no inheritance. Those were the people that were the beggars or the poor. So what was the solution to those in helpless situations? What was the solution to those who didn't have family, didn't have inheritance? Do you know that the word sin, if you were to look up the word sin, harmatia is the Greek word, uh, the first meaning of that word, if you look it up in Strong's uh, and some other, and some other biblical um, dictionaries, the first meaning of the word sin in Greek is to be without share in. To be without a share in. Here's another way we could say it. To be without inheritance. To not have inheritance. Now, what do we think of sin immediately? Wrong actions. Do you know that's actually the last of like five or six definitions? See, the, the, the real issue with sin was not simply wrong actions. It was that because this lie came in, because sin came in, you who were a true son or daughter, now you're living without a share in the inheritance of the family of God. Like you, you removed yourself as an orphan. And so Jesus, this is why, this is why Paul, when he comes in with the gospel, what does he say? The spirit of adoption to restore you from, from being an orphan to being back as a son and daughter of God. Amen? This is, this is the, listen, if I could sum up the entire gospel in one word, I would use the word adoption. Now, it's not adoption the way we think of it today. It's actually more concrete. The word adoption is two Greek words to set in place, and then the second word is son, which, of course, would include daughter, right? Child, right? The word adoption, two Greek words to set in place as a child. To fully establish, firmly establish someone back into the family. This is the desire of the Father. Of all the things that Jesus could have said when he, when he tells the disciples to pray in Matthew 6, of all the things he could have said, like pray our Creator, our Lord, our Master, our King, 
No, what did he say? Our Father. He's revealing this is the very heart of God, not just to be Lord and Creator. The very, the very motivation behind creation was God's desire to expand His family. Amen? Amen? Okay, <clears throat> we're going to have to stop at that one. <laughs> so, uh, um, <clears throat> we'll get to the other ones next time I come in, all right? We'll, we'll finish this up. I, I knew this was going to be a two-part. Um, <laughs> it, might, it, might be, it might be a five-part. <laughs> it could be. You never know. Yeah, but <clears throat> would this, this help today? Yeah. This makes sense today? Uh, let's, let's stand together. I, I want to I just pray for us. And <clears throat> I want you to know that you know, I, I love this, this passage here where Jesus, it says that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him and, and the Spirit of the Lord anointed him, right, for these things. How many of you know that Jesus says the same way, he says this in John, the same way the Father sent me, so now I send you. So when you look at Luke 4.18, you have to insert yourself into the passage. The Spirit of the Lord is upon David. The Spirit of the Lord is upon the Matthews in the house. <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord, right, is upon you. And, and, well, to do what? Well, the first thing, bring people back into their inheritance. Bring people back, people who, are, who, who think they don't have a share they don't have a place. I, I love when King David brings the grandson of Saul to the table. Mephibosheth was his name. Right? And, and so how many of you know that when a new king came in, the, the previous king and, and their family are on the run? Because you're a threat to the throne. We've got to kill all of you. Right? I mean, you, you got to go. And so when this, and Mephibosheth, who was the grandson of King Saul, his nurse is running with him to escape because they think Saul is dead. Somebody else is going to take the throne. We, we have to leave. And when the nurse was running with him, she dropped him, and it says that his legs were damaged. He was, he was uh, damaged or deformed in his legs from that, from that drop. And so... <clears throat> So not only is he, uh, is he an exiled prince, but now he has, he has this physical condition that limits him, and he's got to be in hiding for the rest of his life. So what does David say, who really truly represents the heart of God in this, in this scenario? He says, is there anybody from the house of Saul that I can show kindness to? Oh my goodness. When you get a chance, look this up in Scripture, because when you read it, it is so powerful and so beautiful. And, and they said, well, there is one, Mephibosheth. And so, so David works everything out, brings him to, to the palace, right, to David's home. And, of course, Mephibosheth is scared because he's thinking, is this a trick? What's going on? And David says, don't fear. Don't fear. He says, the land that belonged to your father, that is yours again. I'm giving you your inheritance back. I'm giving you your share back. And you, and you will live, you, you have all that produces that, from that land. Whatever it produces, whatever you have, I'm not taking any of it. It's all, it all belongs to you. It's yours. But not only that, from the rest, for the rest of your life, Mephibosheth, you're going to eat at my table. You're going to eat at the table of the king for the rest of your life. Everything on my table, he says, you will sit at my table as one of my sons. Come on, this is the gospel, my friends. This is the gospel. Right? And so David sits Mephibosheth at the table with all of his other children, with all of his other family, as though he is one of them. This, my friends, is the spirit of adoption. And you know what I love? Is that when Mephibosheth sat at the table, his brokenness was hidden. It was covered. Nobody could look at the table and see, oh yeah, he's got brokenness. He's got a problem. Everybody sat at, at the king's table, and, and the king covered the brokenness of Mephibosheth. How many know the king has covered our brokenness? And even better than that, healed our brokenness. <laughs> Amen? And so, so I, just, I just release to you 
um, this verse, Luke 4, 18. I just say that you have been anointed by the Spirit of God, that you are bringing people back into their share, into their identity, into their inheritance. You're breaking off that beggar mentality from their lives, and you're bringing them into sons and daughters as those who have been set in place as the very children of God. I bless each and every one of you. In fact, I just, I just pray even over our own mindsets that still might have some orphan thinking. Holy Spirit, I welcome you right now to set us free from that orphan thinking, that beggar thinking. We, we, we receive truth right now. You are the spirit of truth, Holy Spirit. And we welcome you to come in with truth that dismantles those lies that has made us in thinking we're beggars and we're in lack. Lord, we thank you. You are our shepherd. We lack nothing. We lack nothing, Psalm 23, 1 says. And so I just say that over you. Not only are you the children of God, the family of God, those that have inheritance in God, but you are also anointed to bring that to your family members, to your friends, to your coworkers, into whatever sphere God has sent you to. So I bless you, my friends, and I look forward to seeing you in part two. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Bless you. <laughs>
spirit place, set our hearts on fire. Low river flow, flood the nations, with grace and mercy, send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, I come to your awesome presence, from the shadows into your radiance. By the blood I may enter your brightness, search me, try me, consume all my darkness, shine on me, shine on me. Grace and mercy, send forth your word.